going to have a word of prayer and then do that, do our Eucharist first today. I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul discussed the church Eucharist, the giving of thanks. It begins in verse 31, and we read through 32. Verse 23 is interesting to me. It always has been. When Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. I want to focus on the betrayal. I don't. When we see pictures of the Last Supper, we probably don't realize how much terrible stuff was involved in that. But we focus on, of course, the good, which is proper and right for us. It's all about Jesus, and then he's going to go to the cross and be buried and raised from the dead. Of course, that's a major issue for us, and, and that's what the Eucharist is about. But the Last Supper, that's not what it was about, even though it was instituted there. The Last Supper was probably one of the greatest crises in the world. Uh, our virus crisis pales in comparison to what went on at the Last Supper. That word betrayal at the supper, Last Supper, the word betrayal was an enormous thing because it involved the, the Roman Empire, the priest nation of Israel and the disciples of Jesus Christ. You talk about a crisis. The Last Supper certainly was taken in the midst of a great crisis. And when you read Luke, the 22nd chapter on this story, you get to see the bigger picture of it. But just stop to think that Christ is going to go through mock trials from two great nations, the Roman Empire. They're going to drop the ball. And the priest nation of Israel, mock trials. Rome knew that this man was innocent. The Jews surely knew it. He was innocent by their law. Rome knew it by their law. And yet, they both threw him under the bus, so to speak. Uh, all about politics. It's, it was all about politics. Uh, here we are today in America. We, we all know it's all about politics. As corrupt just like it was at the supper of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was corrupt, politically, morally, judicially corrupt. And yet we have the most wonderful celebrated thing of the church called the Eucharist in the midst of that crisis. So I want to remind you of that today as we're in a crisis The church was born in a crisis. It will always be in a crisis. If you think that, that the church is somehow not going to be in a crisis, it's always going to be in a crisis. The church of Jesus Christ until the second coming of Christ because we're at the end of time. We're really at the end. The church age, you got the church age, then you got the seven years of tribulation, then I mean, there we are. The church was born in crisis. It, it will exist in crisis. And you've got to understand that. This is just one among many. When you read about the second coming of Christ, it's all about crisis. It's all about crisis. So here we are with that. And here we are in a Eucharist. And here we are at a crisis time in our life. And, and listen, this is normal stuff. The church of Jesus Christ has been spoiled in America. The church of Jesus Christ has been spoiled in America by God's grace. You know, one thing about God's grace, he spoils you. That's a good thing if you have an understanding of it, because that's a good thing. 
but he's got his, quote, fat lazy. We've forgotten about Philippians 129. We've forgotten about it. It has been granted by God to believe in Jesus Christ and to suffer for his namesake. That's it. Shouldn't come as a great shock to you or a great surprise that the fiery trials, like Peter talks about in his first book, the, fire, the fiery trials upon us. <laughs> this virus is no fiery trial. This is piddling compared to what the church has gone through up to now to bring us the message that we have in our souls today under a batter of freedom. None of us have been drug out of church and martyred for our faith. That day is coming if the church doesn't awaken and get back to its fundamental business. We have been on shore leave way too long. We're in a real war. Now, some people, they think this is a cultural war and they think it's a uh, national war, and they think about a lot of that, and then probably that's a lot of truth to all of that. But listen, for the church, it's none of that. For the church, it's not a cultural war. Listen, the church has gone through every kind of unbelievable government you could ever think up. Church has survived. Church has survived. This virus is... Certainly, it's, a, it's a, a test for the church to become spiritually awakened. The fact that there's 186 countries just like us in the same mass shows that God wants, wants a worldwide sweep of reformation. I don't know if the, if the church has it to do it. You know, on the one hand, I hear people say, well, I'm too old and I don't want to do this anymore. And the other ones are too young and they don't want to commit. I mean, who's left? Got to take this stuff serious, I'm telling you. We need to take it very serious. So here's my August Eucharist. We're in a crisis. This should be nothing new for the church. And I'm not sure we're handling it well, personally. We, more people should be coming to faith in Christ Jesus during a spiritual awakening. What a spiritual awakening does is people begin to get saved and they get on fire. This ought to be a time of, of a lot of sharing of the gospel with people. A lot of people should be uh, you should be, their, their, their life are in a lot of trouble and we should be praying for them. We should be in contact with them. That's the power of the telephone and the internet. And we are in contact with a lot of people. A lot of people who have COVID call me. And uh, I try to tell them what this is about and pray for them. Uh, and with that in mind, I just talked to Russell Jones this week. He, he had COVID and his whole family got it. Uh, he was in uh, intensive care for a month. They gave up on him. And uh, God doesn't. Isn't that good? Let me tell you. And he rallied back. And he sounds phenomenal. They got him, they've got him in rehab because they got to teach him how to walk and everything again. W one month in a, in a hospital bed. And so he's going through a lot of rehabbing uh, to get back, quote, on his feet. But he's got more fire in him. And the wonderful thing, in it, he said, I know nothing from the day I went to the hospital until I woke up in the rehab. And God, wonderful. <laughs> Didn't know a thing about that whole, that whole month in ICU. So he's back awake, and he's in rehab, and he's trying to have ministry there like a good soldier. And uh, he thanks you for your prayers. 
Some of you might know Herman Maddox. Maddox. Herman uh, was out of Bob Thames Church, a uh, pastor uh, in Texas. He is in terrible physical health. I mean, terrible. Amongst all of the things they've got, they found a spot on his liver. And he's got heart issues. He's got about everything you can imagine. And they, can, and they need to do surgery. And the hospitals can't, won't take him because of COVID. So there he sits uh, asking for prayer that uh, if the hospitals can't help him, God Almighty heal him. Uh, what a... What a, what a terrible situation. So Herman asked for prayers. Uh, Herman Maddox. Am I saying that right, Al? Maddox. I don't know if there's an X on it. Maddox. But anyhow, do it. Is there an X on it? Uh, so Herman, and he... he I didn't know this, but in talking with him, uh, he got married late in life. He didn't get married till like he was in his 60s. And, and this has occurred within just a few years of being married, his health issues. May that be a sign? No, I don't know. But uh, it, he, he's really struggling. So those are a couple of prayers for So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll do the Eucharist, and we'll have a morning study. As an opportunity is prepared for the Eucharist. Remember, there could not be any sin in your life. You'll be disciplined according to this passage we'll read in a moment. If you take part in the Eucharist with sin in your life, personal sin as a believer. So confession of it is necessary. Mental attitude, sins, sins of the tongue, and avert sins should be confessed in silence or privacy prior to study or prior to taking part in the Eucharist. Father, we're so thankful today. We lift before you some wonderful stories that we've heard about the COVID. A lot of people get it, and they call, and we pray, and they have very little problems with it. Other people have severe problems like the ones we mentioned today and bring before you. Pray for healing upon their life because they had so many other health issues. This has really affected them. I pray there would be great ministry come out of their life from it. It's certainly, at least talking with Russell, it was a spiritual awakening. And uh, my goodness, he sounds really good. And I'm thankful for that, Father. Today, we take part in the Eucharist under a crisis situation. Nothing new for the church, but it seems to be. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister this Eucharist in August. Uh, when they talk about an invisible enemy, they have no idea. That virus is nothing compared to the devil. I pray, Father, we would certainly be awakened to it and have a great ministry out of it. We thank you, Father, for this August Eucharist and the people we have to attend with us. And we lift our congregation to you that is not able to come because they're sick and what other reasons they might have. I thank you, Father, for your grace, your mercy, and your love. Every day, all the way. You're a marvelous, marvelous Father. And our hearts can't thank you enough. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are at the Eucharist passage in 11, I read verse 23, 
when he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It has to be a, a perfect lamb of God body. The body and the blood have to be pure. This is hypostatic union at its best, undiminished deity and true humanity and one unique person of the universe. He has to be born of a virgin, remain hypostatic, be impeccable. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. What a wonderful exchange that was. And so in your bulletin, there are these things that you should do in remembrance. He dies, he's buried, he's raised from the dead, he's seated at the right hand of God, the Father in a resurrection body today, only one as such. And is the Savior of the body and the head of the church. How, how good can that get? And so when we lift our cup, we... We honor the body of Christ that was offered to become the sacrifice for our sins. It was the divine plan that decreed it. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. That was new. It was a new covenant. They lifted the old covenant cup, and he said, this is now the new covenant they, they, they were not a strangers to this idea, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. The Messiah would issue in a new covenant. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. That should have rung a bell in their life, whether it did or not. I don't know. It apparently didn't because they all deserted him. But it should have rung a bell because they understood that the animal blood was shadow Christology. Paul refers to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 as the Passover lamb. That takes us back to Exodus 12, where they had to put the blood on the door, doorpost of the home. And the death angel went over it. They were, they were secured and safe by the blood of Christ. It's just in our life, another crisis. The blood of Christ, you're secured under the blood of Christ in the midst of a crisis. Now, how many, how many places in the Bible do I have to show that to you for you to believe it? And so this cup is a new covenant in my blood. My blood, not animal blood anymore. My blood, the blood of Christ. Do this as long as you drink it in remembrance of me. And as she, it talks about the things that the blood of Christ theologically has secured for the church. Like redemption and reconciliation and propitiation, justification and sanctification and victory in the angelic conflict, peace with God. The list goes on. I, we just put down nine where the blood of Christ is essential for your life. These nine things can never be removed from your life. It is based on the work of Christ on the cross. Both his body and his blood has secured for you your, your eternal redemption. Don't let anybody lie to you. Listen, Christ dies one death for, for all time, and that one death, when you believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, is sufficient to save you forever. You cannot save yourself. You cannot save yourself. And the righteousness is given to you as a gift. Your salvation righteousness is positional. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteous, be made the righteousness of God in him. The moment you believe, you, you have what we call plus R, just an easy way to remember it, the righteousness of God. That's an absolute. That's an absolute. Then he, then he gets into participation in verse 26. He says, as often as you eat, the bread and drink the cup, the cup, that's participation. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, because the significance of verse 23 through 25 through 26, 
Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood. What he's discussed from 23 through 26. Unworthy manner would be to take part in the Eucharist that deals with the, the righteous body and blood of Jesus Christ. It would refer to you taking part with willful sin in your life. Willful sin. Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or first sins need to be confessed before you do it. Before you take part in it. The, the, he says, let a man examine himself. You don't examine your people around you. you. You pay attention to your own life. Let a man examine himself. And so, in other words, the Eucharist, though we do it as a group, is done individually. It's, we do it collectively, but God deals with you individually. Let a person, let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We're, we're not just encouraged, we're commanded to do this. For he who eats, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. And then he explains discipline. For this reason, many among you are weak, Sick and a number of sleep. That's a euphemism for dying death. You know, dying a sin unto death business. Will you go to heaven? Of course. It's not based on how you, how you live or behave. It's based on what you believe about the work of Christ on the cross. How will God deal with you in sin as a believer? Discipline. You need to read uh, Hebrews 12. He will discipline you because he's a father and he wants to correct your behavior. For this reason, many uh, among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. So he comes back to the idea. So if we judge ourselves rightly, that's 1 John 1, 9 for us, we shall not be judged. Divine discipline. We won't get verse 30 if we take care of our own responsibility. Judge yourself. How do I do that? I examine my life in regard to personal sin. Mental attitude, sin, sins of tongue, reverse sin. If I'm aware of them, what do I do? I confess them. What does the blood of Christ do? It cleanses me. Verse 32. When we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. Okay? You see, condemned along with the world, the world's already condemned. <laughs> John 3, 18 and 36 would solve that question. And for the believer, you have Romans 8, 1. There now is no condemnation in the life of, no condemnation of, of the Adamic sin curse. There's none. Positionally. Let's pray and then we'll take part in the Eucharist. Your responsibility, examine yourself, make confession if necessary, and then proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, our Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. I hope those at home could find grape juice or something to take and be part of this under the same rules and regulations. I want to thank you, Father, for the work of your Son on the cross. And Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for fulfilling the will of God in your life as a reminder to me. What's the bottom line when we all get through with all this doctrine? What's the bottom line? to be obedient to the revealed will of God in our life. To walk the walk, not just walk the talk. Encourage our hearts, Father, as we too are in crisis, nowhere near what Jesus and the disciples were in, but nevertheless one. I pray we as a church would be spiritually awakened and be about the Lord's work. 
for this is a high sign, in my opinion, not just for the nation of America, but for 186 or more, a sweep around the world in preparation for a spiritual reformation, one like we have read about that affected America. I make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your cups, let's take the, the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we want to thank you for the, the body of Christ. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He bore our sins on his body on that cross. So we will never have to bear them. Ever. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's do this cup. In the same way, that is with thanksgiving, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we want to thank you for the blood of Christ. We symbolically drank Because it's of the blood, it gives us eternal life. And while that liquid goes into our human body, our participation in it declares that it is the blood of Christ that gives us eternal life now and forever. We thank you for that. And we thank you for that promise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Turning your Bibles to First Kings as we look at our... I was going to look to see how many lessons. I don't know what, how many lessons I've done. We've done several, though. We've gone through the 17th chapter. We're now in the 18th. I want to go back to the same passage we had last week because I want to talk about Obadiah. So I want to pick the subject back up at verse 7, 1 Kings 18, 7. I want to go back through 16, the very same passage we had last week because I want to take a good look at Obadiah. Now, as Obadiah was on his way, you remember Verse 6, he was, a, a, a meeting had been called. He was a top advisor of King Ahab, and a, and a meeting had been called for uh, him and for the, him to meet with the king. Now, as Obadiah was on his way to meet the king, behold, Elijah met him, met him suddenly, stepped out on it, uh, 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 stopped his travel, and and. Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, and this is really important, is this you, Elijah, my master? I want you to pay attention to that word, master. <clears throat> and he said to him, it is I. Elijah refer responded, it is I. Go say to your master, behold, Elijah's here. Now look, same word. Same word in the Hebrew. Master, master. Now, now, now pay attention to this. 
is this, here's Obadiah, is this you, Elijah, my master? He said to him, it is I, go say to your master, behold, Elijah's here. And he said, what sin have I committed that you are giving your servant into the hands of Ahab to put me to death? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master, look, look there. Now, the Obadiah and Elijah understand positions of divine authority. Make sure, you, make sure you do not miss that. The Lord your God, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent to search for you. And when they said he is not here, he made the kingdom or the nation swear that they, they would not, that they could not find you. And now you are saying, go say, say to your master, behold, Elijah's here. And it will come about when I leave you that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you out where I do not know, someplace of hiding. So when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, master servant idea, although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told to my master what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord that I hid a hundred prophets of the Lord by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water? And now you come saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah's here. He will kill me. Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts, that is armies, lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. Obadiah went to meet Ahab, and he told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Obadiah, what an interesting, his name means servant of Yahweh or servant of the Lord. We have not known this man before. Just like Elijah, they show up on the page. Just like you. Just non-existent. And then all of a sudden, a crisis come, and God says, I want you to arise. I want you to be something that you're not comfortable being. I want you to be a servant of me publicly. I want you to get out of your comfort zone. I want you to get out of your comfort zone. And be a servant of the Lord publicly when it's not publicly acceptable. That day's coming. It's coming fast. I'm telling you, it's coming fast. So we meet Obadiah, top advisor to King Ahab. Over the last three and a half years, Israel has been suffering under a drought and other nations around them are. This drought was sent by God to spiritually awaken Israel, to leave the idolatry of Baal worship and return to the worship of the Lord God of Israel. <laughs> Listen, I've been under this thing since March, right? Three and a half years. How about three and a half years? March, April, May, June, July, August. How about three and a half years? Listen. <laughs> Tell God he's got your attention. We're not even in six in this big shutdown business. Th 
three more years of this? See, we all believe we got till November, don't we? <laughs> it magically go away. Well, it's not, it's politically driven, but it didn't come from politics. It didn't come from the nation. Listen, it didn't come from China. Who cares? Sent by God. Where does drought come from? Come from God. What for? Bring a spiritual awakening so a spiritual reformation could occur. Oh, oh my goodness, people. Of all the people in the city of Birmingham, this church ought to know. Now, God is ready to raise up three leaders. Now, watch this. He let that drought hang on for three and a half years. I mean, everything was drying, dried up and dying. I mean, he really left it on him. Now God is re ready to raise up three leaders to lead a spiritual reformation in the north kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes. He's got the prophet Elijah. He's got the statesman Obadiah. And he's got King Ahab. And he's got to have all three on board. <clears throat> now is the time. You know, we always talk about perfect timing and the plan of God. How do you know when perfect timing is there? Huh? When God begins to pull it all together and says, I need you. Now is the time. A whole spiritual awakening is to be able to say to some people in the kingdom, the spiritual kingdom, now is the time. A spiritual awakening always precedes a spiritual reformation. If you go back and you study the history of the reformation that we're familiar with, the, the Luther out of Europe, always this pattern. Always this pattern. Always this pattern. So, here's point number one out of four. God has two of the three leaders and now needs Ahab the king to join him. He's got the national prophet. He's got the statesman, Obadiah. The statesman, the voice of the people. He has the voice of the prophet. He has the voice of the people. <clears throat> he now needs the voice of the king. Elijah and Obadiah have been sent on an emergency meeting with King Ahab regarding the reason for the drought and the reason for the spiritual awakening of a nation. Now it is time for the spiritual reformation and the cleansing of idolatry by the people. It's got to come from the people. But the leaders have to lead. God has placed these three people in positions of leadership for this very hour in biblical history for spiritual impact. This could be the starting for the reunion of the two kingdoms into one priest nation again. Now is the time to stand firm in one faith and fight the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6.12 Because we're in a spiritual war, Ephesians 6.10-17 through 17. How do I know that this is perfect timing? Cle Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes 3. Point number two. God, boy, don't miss this now. This, this applies to every person sitting in here. God is always out front of the spiritually advancing believer who has a special calling. <laughs> that should be calling within the plan of God. 
please get that in your soul. God is always out front of whatever you're facing. He's already, God had already taken care of. All he needs to have you do is walk it out by faith. God is always ahead of where you are. Here's Deuteronomy 31.8. God gives four promises to those who are called for such a time as this. And we all are. You are more than ready and armed well enough in the angelic conflict to fight and win. He gives four promises. That, that, that's Romans 8, 28. He gives four promises in Deuteronomy 31, 8. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. You know what he's talking about in context? A pillar of fire by what? Night. And a pillar of cloud by... You know what that is? That's out front. God is always out front. God is so far out front of this virus... The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. I just gave you Exodus 13, 21 to give you an example. Job had it. Listen, except had it a different way of looking at it. Job had it in Job 1.10. It was called the hedge around him. A hedge, you know, a electric fence, and he was inside. Now, I don't know if they had electric fence. I just... Said that. He will be with you. That's the second thing. He will be with you, like in John 14, 6, the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead, is with you and will be with you forever. 1 John 4, 14. Listen, third, he will not fail you nor forsake you. I told you the other day that Psalms 23, 4, yea, though I walk for the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for uh, thou art with me. He will not fail nor forsake you, written all over the Bible. Hebrews 13, 5, Joshua 5, 1, 5, and 6. One of the things that I love studying. And then the fourth, listen to what he says personally to you. Do not fear or be dismayed. You ought to read Matthew 10, 28. You ought to read that. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, not now, later. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, faithful is he who calls you, and he will bring it to pass. And he'll bring it to pass. Now, let me ask you a question. This is not on your paper. I want you to write it. This could be a gate question. It could be one of your gate questions. Here's the question. Who was the highest authority in this story? Who's the highest authority in this story? Oh, yeah. That's easy to say, isn't it? God. How come we don't believe that? See, we know that's the, the correct answer. But when it comes time to live it out in our life on a 724 week, we really struggle with that. I mean, who is the absolute? This virus, who's in, it, who, who's in the absolute authority in this? Is it Ahab? Mm. Is it Obadiah? Mm. Is it Elijah? Mm. Who's in charge? Who, who's, who's really the authority over the other thing? It's God Almighty. That, that, that drought was going to be there until God says, okay, I'm going to pull it back. We'll see where we are. I thought it was interesting that he didn't do it for a year and pull it back and take a look. 
because he had already done that stuff. And all, all the discipline in that nation, because of their idolatry, all it, did, all it did was to cause the people to become more darkened in their soul towards God. So he put it on him for three and a half years. I mean, we got right down to eating dirt and calling it souffle. You see, now he pulls it back, sends the rain. He's got three guys. He's got to have three guys to have a spiritual reformation. If there's been a spiritual awakening, the people will rise up and listen. There was a spiritual awakening in the nation. You're going to see it when we hit Mount Carmel. We need three guys, and he's got them in positions. God is always out ahead. Who is the greatest authority? Here's a passage. You should write down Psalms 27.1 and 28.7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart exalts within me, and I have a song of thanksgiving. How wonderful. Point number three, Obadiah was a spiritually mature believer who had already been forced out of his comfort zone to rescue a hundred prophets from being murdered by Jezebel, 1 Kings 18, 13. See, he's already been forced out once of his comfort zone. God is preparing for a spiritual reformation. Obadiah has already been tested as a spiritual mature believer and has proved that he feared the Lord more than Jezebel and Ahab. He says, I go back and I say, Elijah, he's going to kill me. I've already been through this once. I'm not going to get through it a second time. I think he'll kill me. You know what, the, what you should ask him? So what? Well, Ron, if I get COVID, I could die. So what? What's the worst thing that could happen to you? It's certainly not death. That's the best thing that could happen to you. You think you're going to get out of this world any other way? Well, I know you want to go to the rapture. That's all right. I've never preached that one, so I don't know. But I've preached at a lot of funerals. I'm just saying, you know, if you're going to Vegas and going with odds, <laughs> I'm just saying, the odds are. Obadiah was a spiritual mature believer who already understood that Elijah was the national prophet with equal divine authority with the king in the plan of God. Right? Used the word master in our passage used four times. And they both understood what they were talking about. He's talking to Elijah, and Elijah's talking to Obadiah, and these two guys know what they're talking about scripturally. I put that on your paper. The spiritual mature believer does not live nor die for himself. but for the cause of Christ. Philippians 1, 21 through 23. You know, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Whether I live, I live for Christ. Whether I die, I die for Christ. Therefore, what's, it, what's the deal? Living for Christ. The issue is, it's all, my life is all about Jesus Christ. My life is all about Jesus Christ. Whether I live or I die, it's about Jesus Christ. Is that not simple? 
There's nothing complicated about that. Nothing complicated. Second Thessalonians 3.3, 3, but the Lord is faithful. And he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Is that a promise for your life? The Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. That's Satan. He's the promoter of evil in the world. Point number four. As a spiritual mature believer, Obadiah understood that meeting Elijah at this specific time was not an accident or a chance meeting. It was by divine appointment, Ecclesiastes 3. He knows that. Look, do you not understand that this COVID whole thing here is by divine appointment? Do you not know that when you go to the doctor's office and he says you got wanga ganga, there may not be a cure for it? Do you not know that that's but divine appointment? And what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with it? I'll tell you what you should do with it. You should say, listen, I'm a special person in the plan of God or this wouldn't be out of my life. That God has prepared me for this hour. This is perfect timing of the plan of God. I've got to step out of my comfort zone. And I've got, to be, I've got to be a proclaimer of Christ in my life. For me to live as Christ and to die as Christ. So why has he got this on you? Bring a spiritual awakening in your life. You got to get out of your comfort zone. A comfort zone publicly, openly. Share your faith in Christ. This is not what it seems like. Don't get focused on why you're in, in, in the situation. It's not about a virus. It's about what you're going to do with it. It's not about what kind of disease you might have or whatever else is in your life. It's not what it's about. It's not what it's about. My, my, my. It's, you're always going to have something. It's not what it's about. And listen, when it touches to one of your children or it touches one of your mates, listen, you got to understand what the Lord is doing collectively with you. You can sit around and say, oh, I wish this hadn't come to me. I wish this hadn't been my... But of course you don't choose it. Listen, who would choose this? Of course you don't choose it. God chooses it for you because you're ready to do it. And you will be, listen, you will be better for it in the end. I, I said in the end. You'll be better for it. You've got to believe that. How, how else could you live with it? We all have something. And sometimes it's not you. I mean, sometimes it's your daddy. It's your mama. It's your wife. It's your kid. You've been caught collectively in it. But it's just as important for you as it is for them. This is a big deal. I said that, I said that to Russell the other day. I said, listen, the fact that you're back, back into life with an awareness, listen, what does that mean to you? Listen, I've seen it so many times in people's lives. I saw it with Chuck Farmer and yada, 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 yada. Boy, it's what you do with it when you come, be, get awake from a spiritual sleep. It's what you do with it. Oh, boy, I mean, I'm talking to somebody. If nobody else but me, I'm talking to somebody. Well, Obadiah has certainly understood this meeting is no coincidence or accident, no more than anything else in our life is. It's divine appointment, Ecclesiastes 3. He must take seriously this unexpected meeting and pay special attention to what the prophet Elijah has to say to him. And he, did he ever. He listened to everything he said. He took it serious because he understood this was a divine appointed meeting. 
He is struggling with it, but he's dealing with it. He understood the doctrine of the perfect timing and the plan of God. Obadiah was instructed to set up a special meeting between Elijah and Ahab. To do this, Obadiah must face and, and spiritually fix his greatest fear of man. He says that when I go back, I won't get a second. He will not look past a second deal. He said, I already got one pass, that hundred prophets. He'll kill me just as sure as anything. He'll kill me. And he and and he was really he was really concerned about the idea that he will kill me. Elijah made it very easy for him. He said, look, I'll take the heat. Just go say to your master, Elijah, behold, Elijah's here. He said, well, that's the problem, Elijah. I say that, he's going to kill me. He saw that as a real threat to his life. But you know what? Listen to this. Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, is greater than the king. The Lord that I serve is greater than anything. Before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. Not tomorrow. Ahab thinks, well, this fool has walked right into, into my hands. I've been hunting for him everywhere. He walked right in here. You know, here I am. Of course I'll take that meeting. Clear my schedule. I'm going to meet the betrayer of Israel. Well, you have to look in the mirror to find him. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab, and he told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Listen, did Obadiah once again step out of his comfort zone? <laughs> I mean, he has said, he will kill me, he will kill me, he will kill me, he will kill me. Normally, that kind of inner dialogue wins the war. But when Elijah got through talking to him, he began to say to himself, the Lord is my strength and my protector. The Lord is my strength and my protector. The Lord is my strength and protector. The Lord is my strength. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. You know that inner dialogue changed, didn't it? Because he went. By faith, he went, and he told him exactly what had happened and let the chips fall where they fall. Because I believe my God is ahead of me and is my protector one way or the other. Do you believe that? You have that kind of relationship with the Lord to have that kind of faith. You say, well, he didn't have any options. Yeah, he had options. We always have options, don't we? Just depends on whether or not they, they fit the plan of God. So here's what I close with. John, 1 John 4, 18. There's no fear in God's love. You see, when you love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, that's pretty sellout, ain't it? That's selling all the way out. Love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, all my mind, all my everything. So that's, that's, that's my all everything. That's the love for God. You know God loves you, don't you? 
How do you know that? Sent his son to die for you in the worst state you'll ever be in. Lost, bound to hell. There's no fear in love. There's no fear in God's love. But you got to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. You, see, you, can't, you can't love your neighbor until you love God that way. And when you do, you can love your neighbor that way. You can love your neighbor with all your strength, soul, mind, whatever. That's a problem with us today in the church. We don't love God that way, and we don't love each other that way. It's a terrible mess. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. See, that's what the love of God is all about. Because fear involves self-induced misery, punishment, self-induced misery. And the one who fears is not perfected in God's love, not matured. The word perfected means matured, has not, has not found a complete completion in it, has not found the healthiness of it. No fear in God's love. God's love overcomes fear. You got to love God with all of your heart, soul, spirit, and strength, mind. You know how difficult that is to do? Try that for a week. Try that for a week. You'll find it's more difficult than it is to talk it. It's more difficult to walk it. To love him absolutely as if nothing else mattered. I love him with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength and all of your spirit, your mind. Now you got something to offer the world. Unconditional love. Unconditional love. Unconditional love. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. We pray, Father, as we looked at Obadiah today, we saw a spiritual mature believer overcome his fears by faith wasn't facts. Facts led more. Listen, facts led to more fear. It was faith that conquered it. You come to understand that there's no fear in the love of God. May we learn that kind of love. Teach us how to love you, Father, in that way that there are no options out. That we're going to love you with all, 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 not some. That's the way most of us do it, Father. We're going to love you all, all the way, all the time. In Jesus' name, amen.